Well, good afternoon. My name is David Lakey. I currently serve as a vice chancellor for health affairs at the University of Texas System, and it's a privilege to be here today. And in my four minutes, I'm going to try to discuss with you several important programs we have here in the state of Texas to provide better mental health services to those that are hard to reach. The first point is that mental health services really are inadequate nationwide, that mental health symptoms are very common. More than one-fifth of U.S. adults have had a mental health issue in the last year. And if we look at the last decade, the number of adults with any mental health issue increased by about 30%. Likewise, during the decade, we saw a 41% increase in the number of high school students who felt hopeless or depressed. And we saw a 62% increase in suicide deaths. There's a significant delay between the symptoms when they first occur and when individuals get their, their initial evaluation. It's about a decade historically. And that decade has consequences where individuals' lives deteriorate in a variety of ways that I've listed on this slide. We also know that mental health resources are very limited nationwide. About 130 million individuals in the United States lived in a health professional shortage area related to mental health. And most states have less than 40% of the mental health workforce that they need. So I'm gonna discuss two specific programs that are being built here in the state of Texas that came out of the 2019 legislative session. So the first program is called CPAN, the Texas Child Psychiatric Access Network. It's a network of physicians based in our medical schools across the state of Texas that provide services to the primary care providers in their geographic location. And you can see in the map the different medical schools across the state and the areas of the state that they're responsible for. Uh, we activated this program in May of 2020, and currently the services are available to any physician, uh, any primary care provider in the state of Texas, taking care of kids. If we look at this last month, we are now in about 1,755 clinics that are enrolled, about 9,400 providers, and have provided about 13,000 consults in the last year. The average response time between when a physician calls the number and receives services is just a little over six minutes. And a new program that we're developing right now, we started this in August, we're doing the same work in perinatal health, providing services to OBGYN, family medicine doctors, people that take care of women during that first year of, of life uh, after delivery. The second program is the Texas Child Health Access through Telemedicine. Basically, this provides a mechanism where if a teacher or a counselor has a child that they're worried about, they can very rapidly get the child into mental health support. The first child was referred to this program in April of 2020. We currently are in 3,706 schools, and you can look at the rest of the data on the slide about our current activity. But that covers about 2.4 million kids. We've been directed by the legislature to build it out to any school that wants the program. And with that, we will cover about 5.4 million kids here in the state of Texas. For both of these programs, there's significant challenges and barriers. Uh, one has been building out large programs in the midst of a pandemic because people don't want to move. And so the workforce has been challenging and building that workforce we need here in the state of Texas. And it's been important to build trust with our primary care providers in the schools that we're trying to serve. Next, it's a challenge related to the schools related to space. And some of the schools don't have the broadband capacity that you believe that they should have in order to provide these services. And then finally, uh, there are some changes that were made available during the, the pandemic that made the prescription of medications through telemedicine more readily available. And we're concerned that with the end of the pandemic and the end of the public health emergency, that it may become more difficult in the future. Thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you in person in the future. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. I'm going to be talking about using telehealth to empower primary care providers in the treatment of hepatitis C and the Cherokee Nation. So in 2011, I was hired by the Cherokee Nation as an infectious disease specialist, and one of my jobs was to treat hepatitis C. When I got there, we evaluated that we had 263 patients that needed treatment, but looking at seropositivity rates, we estimated that we had over 1,800 patients who needed to be diagnosed and treated. And I was the only hepatitis C provider and there were nine different clinics who got the Cherokee Nation. The left-hand side, you can see the map of the Cherokee Nation. It's in northeastern Oklahoma. The little star is where the hospital is, and the red crosses are where the outlying clinics are. And this is not a problem unique to Cherokee Nation. It's a nationwide problem, and as you can see on the top left, 
the CDC reported that acute hepatitis C disproportionately affects Native Americans, and also the mortality is much higher compared to other ethnic groups. So how to solve this problem? I ran into this article in the New England Journal of Medicine published by Dr. Aurora from the University of New Mexico, and in which he used a telehealth platform to treat patients with hepatitis C. So there are patients that need treatment. There's not enough specialists. So using this program, which develops a hub, which consists of hepatitis C specialists that connect with the spokes or the primary care providers and train them on weekly sessions on how to treat patients. Basically, the providers present the cases to the specialist and the patients get the right care in the right place at the right time. So this is what we did in Cherokee Nation. If you look at the map on the right, we started with one clinic in Tahlequah where the hospital is. And after the training with this telehealth program, we were able to cover the whole geographic region of the Cherokee Nation Health Services. And we, as I mentioned, we trained 15 primary care providers and eight pharmacists, and we were able to treat almost a thousand patients, 764 were cured, and we prevented many patients from developing hepatitis C complications, such as cirrhosis, liver cancer, and extrahepatic manifestations. And we went a bit further and also trained these providers on harm reduction, because many of these patients with hepatitis C have substance use disorders that need medication-assisted therapy. So if you look in the graph on the left, the, on the x-axis is the number of patients uh, treated for hepatitis C every trimester. The line is the cumulative number of cases treated. As you can see, when I was the only specialist, very few patients were treated. By mid-2019, almost 1,000 patients had been treated. And when you look at the graph on the right, uh, we can see that the outcomes were very similar when nurse practitioners, physicians treated the patients compared to a specialist. Actually, percentages are higher for the nurse practitioners and physicians, 98%, and there are only 92% for physicians, I'm sorry, for specialists, but this was not statistically significant, and this was regardless if they had cirrhosis or not. Due to the success of this program, we expanded Project ECHO, not only for hepatitis C, but we started including patients, training our providers and managing HIV PrEP general infectious diseases, and substance use disorders. And I just wanted to share this experience with you because it could be useful if you're not already doing it. And I would be delighted to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm delighted to tell you about some of the activities at the University of Texas at Arlington that we're doing to address rural nursing shortages and primary health care shortages in rural communities. We're one of the largest schools of nursing in the country and are delighted to have just started a Center for Rural Health and Nursing, focusing on the nursing shortage. Nursing shortage here in Texas and in the country was really bad before the pandemic, and it has only gotten worse. And the old strategies that have worked at times and maybe never worked fully need to be enhanced. And so what we are doing is reaching out to the rural communities to partner together to try to improve the integration of rural nursing content and our academic programs provide continuing education and provide access for residents who want to stay living in their own home and become registered nurses, get a baccalaureate degree in nursing, or become nurse practitioners, or for RNs who would like to go and obtain a baccalaureate degree in nursing and stay in their own home. One of the things we have done is because Texas rural areas are so spread out, in fact, all over Texas, is we've hired five nurse liaisons that are assigned to five different regions of Texas that go out and meet with leaders in hospitals and other healthcare agencies there to determine who is interested, who has a provider shortage that they would like to work on with us. And we are doing a lot of work to try to expand our online pre-licensure new to becoming an RN program so that we would have more 
communities where people could live in their community and do their clinical rotations with our faculty in their home community. And so anyone who is interested in talking further about that, welcome to contact our center. We also realize that a part of bringing education into the community is to be able to have equivalent kind of experiences for education. And we are in the process of purchasing a clinical simulation van so that when we're working with a community or we're educating pre-licensure RNs in the community where perhaps there's not a clinical simulation lab enough to support the education that we would be able to bring one and we're very excited about this opportunity. We're excited about a lot of our projects, but one in particular would be our community academic partnerships. We are looking for projects that may represent a quality improvement project or an access to care project or an education challenge that we can work together on to design a project and to carry it out and evaluate it. This is something that I invite you to reach out to us if you have an idea and also if your community is interested in a collaboration. Thank you. An important and perhaps unexpected lesson learned during the COVID-19 pandemic was that the lack of trust in the public health system generated significant barriers to disease containment efforts and vaccine uptake. I didn't know that we could have foreseen that vaccine promotion would consume nearly as many resources as vaccine development. The Lancet recently published an article that explored contextual factors associated with COVID-19 infection and fatality rates in 177 countries. Headlines from the popular media reporting of the study are presented in the middle of the screen. Quoting from the paper abstract, efforts to improve pandemic preparedness and response for the next pandemic might benefit from greater investment in risk communication and community engagement strategies to boost the confidence that individuals have in public health guidance. So who's a trusted source of health information and is effective at community engagement? and is poised to inform health promotion strategies and future pandemic response? The answer continues to be community health workers. CHWs are a critical component of the healthcare workforce. According to the American Public Health Association, a community health worker is a frontline public health worker who is a trusted member of and or has unusually close understanding of the community served. The Rural Health Information Hub states that CHWs often share life experience with the population they serve, such as ethnicity, socioeconomic status, language, or medical condition. While CHWs have traditionally worked with racial and ethnic minority populations, in recent years, they have begun to serve a wider variety of rural, urban, and underserved populations. The COVID-19 pandemic generated substantial resource investment in expanding the CHW workforce. Unfortunately, we lack adequate numbers of CHWs in the healthcare workforce, and we have sustainability issues related to reimbursement for CHW services. The map on the left shows CHWs by location quotient, a statistic that measures state CHW workforce relative to the nation. An LQ less than one means that the state is less saturated than the national average, while an LQ greater than one means that the state has a higher concentration of CHWs than the nation. Based on this metric, states in dark red have relatively high concentrations of CHWs, while states in tan or pink have relatively low concentrations. The map on the right shows CHW Medicaid reimbursement by state. About half the states offer no Medicaid reimbursement for CHW services, limiting their ability to work with the most vulnerable populations. There is, however, some good news. The federal government recognizes the value of CHWs and earlier this year dedicated well over $200 million to fund CHW training programs across the country. Those programs are scheduled to begin this fall. So, lack of trust in the public health system remains an issue. CHWs are critical to bridging the gap between healthcare systems and communities. CHWs have a comprehensive list of core competencies and I'm humbled by their work expectations. 
CHWs are as important to urban underserved populations as they are to rural populations. There are, however, greater training challenges for rural-based CHWs. There's limited access to in-person training and broadband access can be inconsistent. Effective use of CHWs will require robust continuing education that can be disseminated quickly when needed. A recent example is the need to rapidly disseminate information on monkeypox. I leave you with the following question to explore during this unconference. Given that telementoring is an effective training strategy, how can telementoring be effectively used for CHW workforce development? Thank you.